Professor Liz Grant, talk me through your career in public health, both at home and abroad. So I've had quite an eclectic career in public health. I started university doing a degree in religious studies and English some long time back at Aberdeen University and then went on to do a PhD um, and this is where it gets interesting. My PhD is a mix of theology and health and public health. I went to Sierra Leone just before the war started um, in the late 1980s and looking at how at that stage in the late 1700s, early 1800s, freed slaves were brought back into the country of Sierra Leone as the, uh, as the British government passed the Abolition of Slavery Act. Um, it was an extraordinary time of watching a community and trying to understand what, how a community developed, how laws were set, how governments brought together um, different, different groups of people from across West Africa who were freed um, through the, the Abolition Act. From there, I came back um, into the UK again and finished my PhD. Went on to actually work in the Medical Research Council at the Edinburgh University, um, uh, looking at um, young, well people at risk of schizophrenia. So I was moving from sort of development health further into health again, into medicine, and then um, from there went to work in Kenya. And I worked there in a large hospital as a community health advisor with my husband and our two girls for five years. And then came back into the UK and started to work in um, NHS um, public health. And I worked in the public health directorate and then into Scottish government, working as a health advisor for um, the Scottish government's Malawi partnership at that stage in 2005 up until 2009 and then come back into Edinburgh University. So I've had rather an eclectic move around but all of it focused in a sense in looking at public health, looking at the intersection between public health and health of community, health of the land and also looking at sort of faith issues and development issues in that intersection. You're the director of Edinburgh University's Global Health Academy. What does the Academy do? Sure. So the Academy was set up in 2009 for the purpose of bringing together um, the community across the university to think about global health. And it has, it's based on three premises, which I'll tell you about because they really describe and, and sort of enable us to understand the, the intent of the Academy. And the premises are that we're all born equal. That may seem so obvious and we all may say, yeah, of course we're born equal, but actually this premise says we are born equal, but into really unequal circumstances. And in particularly in health, there's something we can do about that. The second premise is that the answer to most of the world's questions are actually in the world already. The only catch is that often we're not listening to the people who have answers. And this is particularly true of academia, that we're not understanding that those who are often at the edges of society know best what to do, actually understand the intersection and the dynamics of challenges. So much of the work of the academy is to think, who, who has the answers to the questions? What are the questions? Do we need to rephrase the questions so we can hear the answers? And the third premise is that all of the challenges are intersected together, they're entangled. We can't deal with one challenge without understanding the other challenges. We are living in a perfect storm and therefore we really need to think about health, not just as one part, but actually as the health of humans alongside the health of the environment, the health of the economy, the health of animals, the health of the, the land, the sea, the air, ecosystems. So that, those are the three premises. The Academy then uses, builds on those three premises and offers um, educational work um, around online masters, particularly for those from lower or middle income countries who are busy in their work. They can't leave their work because they're often, particularly with medicine, um, with nursing, they're some of the few people actually in the hospitals. So these online programmes are specifically set up for being done part time and um, very focused around um, the needs of um, lower middle income country learning. 
Um, we also support research right across the, the spectrum and we support a community of practice, realising that students, staff, our alumni and actual partners at the university, partners with, together matter and if we bring those people together, all of them, um, we can have a, a much more vibrant understanding of what global health is about. You've pretty much answered this already but I'm asking everybody the same question. What does One Health mean to you? One Health or planetary health is not new, even though over the last, I suppose, 20 odd years there's been so much discussion about One Health and certainly over the last five years a lot of discussion around the concepts of planetary health. But I say it's not new because if you go back to indigenous communities, if you go back to sacred scriptures and almost every um, religion or community, you realise that that concept of One Health has is, is always been there, that actually people understood and understand that health is interconnected. So for me, that is why it's so important. It's something that is as old as the world itself. It's, it's as old as people um, functioning in the world, realising that it really matters to nurture the land in order to nurture um, self. The key topic of the conversation is Generation Alpha, what skills, training and technology will they need for One Health possibilities of the future. Firstly, define Generation Alpha for me and then explain why we need to focus on that generation. OK, so Generation Alpha are those people who are born fully in the 21st century, who will live all their lives in the 21st century. Um, technically those uh, young people who are born from tw um, 2010 onwards. Um, and the reason that we need to focus our energies on Generation Alpha is because Generation Alpha are our future. They're the future of the way the world is going to be. We, and we owe such a debt to our young people because our young people are carrying on everything that all of us are doing at present. They're carrying that to the future and they're redesigning and redefining redef uh, what the future is. So Generation Alpha, unless we invest in Generation Alpha, unless we really engage and understand the needs of Generation Alpha, unless we're able to share um, with Generation Alpha um, the concepts that, that we have of the future and hear their concepts, we're lost. So that's, that's Generation Alpha for me. Do you think there's sufficient awareness of One Health among this generation and older generations? No. Um, in fact, I think probably Generation Alpha have more awareness of One Health than um, the many generations. Um, but I still think we are in a, a massive gap of knowledge here. Um, and I wonder if COVID pandemic will actually help people begin to understand something about One Health that they hadn't understood before. But generally, people work in silos. Our education system has been um, structured in silos. We choose disciplines and we become expert in those disciplines, thinking that we can solve the world's problems within those disciplines. And I think what One Health shows us is we can't. We need to be working um, together. We need to be working intersectorally. I, I think our education system, um, particularly for Generation Alpha, uh, the education system now, I'm, I'm saying now in Scotland, is really beginning to develop and draw together a thinking that says that unless we share knowledge, unless we think about working across disciplines, unless we begin to understand that um, a, a, a good action um, for one community could potentially be a negative action for another, or a good action uh, in one framework, a good action, a good monetary action as it were, could actually have huge negative implications around agriculture or around forestry. Unless we begin to um, enable, um, I suppose, everyone to, be, to, to see those connections and see them through our education system, then we, we will feel. In 2015, the United Nations launched 17 Sustainable Development Goals and pronounced, we are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want to heal and secure our planet. To what 
extent is One Health key to achieving those goals? Sustainable development goals are interesting because, as you say, there's 17 goals. And goal 17 is about partnership. And unless all the goals are met, one of them can't be met. And I think that's a bit that perhaps we haven't really understood. They're a blueprint for a different world. In the preamble to the Sustainable Development Goals, there's lines that almost sound um, extraordinary. They talk about the healing of the nations. They talk about leaving nobody behind. The Sustainable Development Goals are pro-poor. They're really saying that we need to eradicate poverty. We need to understand the suffering that's in the world. And from understanding the suffering, we need to take action collectively. I think, coming back to the question you asked me, is that summation of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, is that One Health? I think One Health is actually the, I suppose, the, the storyboard that allows us to deliver to the Sustainable Development Goals. Because those goals, those 17 goals, no matter how we um, understand that they're connected, and we do, they are separate as well. There's 17 separate goals. Whereas One Health says, I can take those 17 goals and I can bring them into um, a weaving. I can make a sense of them collectively. I can show that if you work in climate change, you also are going to work around gender equity and equality. If you work in education, you're also going to improve healthcare output. So I think that is what One Health does. How worried are you that the global nature of this work will be hindered by this growing sense of insular nationalist politics? I'm hugely worried, hugely worried, because the Sustainable Development Goals were signed by all the nations together um, at the UN General Assembly in 2015. And we need all the nations together to proactively work to bring the, the goals to fruition. Um, if, if nations dis, um, become apart, if nations begin to become insular, if nations decide that what matters is their people, and not just their, all of their people, but often a certain group of their people in society, if that happens, then the goals won't be met globally, but they'll not even be met nationally in countries because there'll be divisiveness in countries. The other element of this work uh, involves a lot of global travel. You've alluded to the impact of COVID. That's going to reduce the amount of travel that people can do. Is that going to hinder the One Health approach? No, in fact, I think, if anything, that's going to um, improve the One Health approach. Um, you're right that a lot of um, global development work did actually involve huge amounts of travelling, people going from one place to the other. And that carbon footprint um, was horrific. Uh, it was almost, in, in a sense, for me, the juxtaposition of my work where I was um, advocating for planetary health, for this understanding of the, the intersection of the uh, human and health and the health of the environment, and yet being on a plane and recognising how, how d deadly that is, uh, literally, how bad that is for the environment. So I do think that what COVID-19 has shown us um, is that we can do an awful lot of work without um, getting on aeroplanes and, and traversing the world. Um, and, and we know that during the um, initial lockdown period, um, we, we saw a, 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 an extraordinary strangeness in the world when the air did become cleaner in, in many places. But that strangeness came at a horrendous price, as we know, and that while the mitigation strategies for um, trying to contain COVID-19, you know, meant that we, we were trying to stop stop travel, it, they also, those mitigation strategies also were really destructive for many communities who were poor because they carried the worst burden, they carried the, they, they couldn't access food, they couldn't access what was needed. So I, Coming back to that question you asked, will, will travel help or hinder? I think it'll help the One Health envi uh, environment, it'll help the One Health agenda, but it will depend on that One Health agenda, understanding that not everybody has access to the, the technology that has allowed a lot of work to continue. 
And this is now not about not um, having the technology. This is now saying to One Health, we need to ensure that every body across the world, that every society has the technologies, that there's equity around the technologies that allow connection. You mentioned technology. What sort of technology does this generation need to achieve the goals? The technologies that many actually of Generation Alpha have, probably even more than, than, than I have, around using um, the internet, using um, IT, um, being able to be virtually connected. But I also think there's other technologies, or maybe I should say other skills that are associated with technology. And I think Generation Alpha, if I had the opportunity to really invest in education to support Generation Alpha, I'd be saying that I would like Generation Alpha to understand the value of relationships, the value of participatory work, technology that allows participation, not just um, question and answer, not just lecture and learning, but actually involves listening. And I think listening is a skill that can be taught, that should be taught, that we should be able to listen to each other, listen globally um, in a way that we haven't really done before. So that's one of the tools or one of the skills that I would really advocate for Generation Alpha to pick up on on. To that end, you're co-director of the Edinburgh University Global Compassion Initiative. What does that involve? That's an interesting initiative. It's an initiative across the university. Um, and I'm, before I answer that, I'm going to actually define compassion because a lot of people think compassion, oh, it's just being nice, being kind. And of course, it is about being kind. But compassion is an interesting concept. It literally means calm, passion with, passion with suffering. And you might think, what's suffering got to do with One Health? But actually, it's got everything to do with One Health. Compassion is divided into four component parts. It involves noticing suffering, actually being able to recognise that there's suffering out there, there's suffering here. It involves then understanding our relation to suffering. So you may see suffering, but you may think, oh, that's somebody else's pain, it's not mine. But actually compassion involves being able to understand that someone else's pain is connected to me and that I may be part of that pain. It involves feeling, the part that we might call empathy. Um, really actually feeling concern, feeling sadness, feeling the weight of somebody else's suffering, and it involves action. And that's a bit that's often left out when we think about compassion as just being kind and nice. So if we take those four parts together and then apply them or think about them in the context of One Health, I think this is what One Health or Planetary Health does. It says that there's suffering in the world, that actually there's people are suffering because of climate change, families are suffering because there is, there is no food. There's no food because there's been droughts. There's droughts because of climate change. There's droughts because of the way that society has managed its industry. Um, but it's not just enough to, to notice that and to, it's important to that second part understanding. I'm probably a part of that. Whatever I purchase has an impact. Whatever I do, how I, I use energy has an impact somewhere else. It's not just enough understanding, it's that feeling, actually. What is it to suffer? Can I go to bed at night and really be happy and not bother that someone is, is sleeping hungry, that somebody is in screaming with, in pain because of actions in the world today? And if I do that, can, how do I take action? So for me, that's compassion. And that is very much what the Global Compassion Initiative is about. It's saying to everyone, all our students, our staff, Actually, if we lived with compassion, would that help us take the knowledge we have in education and apply it? Because in the end of the day, what is a university for? A university is to make the world a better place. You also work with faith communities. Academia, science seem strange bedfellows with faith. How is that changing? And that is changing hugely um, at the minute. I think because of um, science 
itself, if we can actually think of science as a, as a thing. And that is, that's challenging because there's so many different components of science. Science isn't one small piece of a life and then suddenly there's faith somewhere else and there's the economy somewhere else. It's, it's all interconnected. But I, science, and particularly One Health Science, really gets us to think about things outside sectors and silos. It really begins to show that our, that human health and environmental health and the health of the oceans or the sea, the health of rivers, the health of land are all interconnected. And I think once you start thinking that, then you begin to realise that there is much more to life. There's an intricate web of life that is beyond science. Alongside that, I think the pandemic, COVID pandemic, has really made us begin to challenge what we know of science and begin to also ask us to think how do we care for each other? How do we think about each other? As we think about our um, physical health, we think about our spiritual health, our mental health, our emotional health. And I think people have begun to see these are not separate parts, but they're one part of a whole. And finally, how do you get more people and perhaps more importantly, more policymakers engaged with One Health? I wish I knew the answer to that, but I'll give you my ideas. Um, I think some of this is about actually making explicit what One Health is, but also not being so controlling or so prescriptive um, that people feel, oh, that is interesting, but that belongs to somebody else. That's not my take, that's not my call. Because in fact, the key thing about One Health is, is everybody's call. And the minute you get that, the minute you realise that this is not about a separate discipline somewhere or a, se a separate set of disciplines that are intersected together, but this is actually about the way of my way of living, then we begin to change, I think, our attitudes around One Health. One Health becomes um, so critical from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night. It gets, it's critical in the way that we think about ourselves, our neighbours, we think about those in another part of the country, another country altogether. And by, by helping, I suppose, for policymakers, key is to help and work with policymakers to give the data, the evidence that says that human health and environmental health are interconnected, that biodiversity matters, that ecosystem health is part of how we actually function and flourish. That's one part of it, providing the, that data and evidence. And I think a lot of that's happening at the minute. But the second part, I suppose, is, is working alongside policymakers to understand what their challenges are in um, enacting policy, enacting laws. What is it that is stopping that happening? And often what's stopping it happening is sets of systems and previous policies which have gone down singular tracks. Because so much of our systems, and I can talk more specific, specifically about, about health, because that's the, the, the work I'm involved in, but so much health, even if you think of human health, so much health has always assumed that, you know, there's different diseases, and we manage one disease or another disease or another disease. And now we're in a world of multimorbidity that you realise that there, people rarely have one disease. They often have a number of illnesses together. Um, or the drivers of one illness are also the drivers of other illness. Um, and yet our health system is often structured around these one diseases. So a lot of work has to happen to move the previous structures, which have been formed around single and silo systems, to move into this um, interconnected system. And also to allow, I think policymakers need um, academics, they need partners, they need students, they need educationalists to work together with them to think about what are the what are the points of entry into current systems that can bring about change without toppling them, but can bring about transition pathways. So what's the point of entry where we begin to think in One Health where we can bring about enough change without destroying what's there until we can rebuild the, a, new, a new piece of work. Professor Liz Grant, thank you very much. Thank you.